Hello? Oh, is Michael there, please? Yes, is this Mr. Rick Emmett? It is. Wow, I'm <laughs> so honored to be speaking with you. It's a true privilege. Oh, thank you. I mean, you're uh, a true hero of mine, both your uh, lyrics, your vocals, your guitar playing. I mean, you're a true icon of mine. <laughs> oh, that's great. Thank no. you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Definitely. Um, I've been trying to do my research to find out stuff about you that I didn't already know. Um, and it's interesting to see that you're a humanitarian, that you've done so much to contribute to so many wonderful causes over the years since you've left Triumph. Yeah, you know, I mean, <laughs> I don't like to make a big deal of it. I just figure it's uh, it's just part and parcel of, you know, I've, I've, I've had a, a blessed and kind of good life, you know. I've had a lot of luck, and um, I, I think uh, it's probably part of my, I don't know, responsibility, duty to kind of um, give back a little bit. And, yeah. So I, I guess it was the way I was brought up. It's the way I think. So. Well, that's good. And you've always had such a positive outlook in, in everything you've done. Like I said, I'm a huge fan of your lyrics. Um, obviously, I've been a Triumph fan since, since I was very young. But I remember when I was just in high school and I bought Sport of Kings, right when the uh, Somebody's Out There single came out. And, you know, just the lyrics on that, like, if only, you know, and I take a stand. I still use those lyrics... In, in everyday language every day. Like, my wife will say something, I'll be like, if only dreams would come true. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, um, it's, that's nice to hear. I mean, I I do appreciate the fact that uh, I've had a, a long run at, at contributing to the soundtrack of people's lives, which, you know, when you start out, that's, that's what you hope for. And... Um, uh, I always felt, too, that it was important that uh, the work that I did was not just about, uh, you know, trying to, uh, to exact a kind of a, a commercial success, um, you know, uh, celebrate the fact that, hey, I'm a rock star, I hear songs about being a rock star, you know, or whatever. I, mean, I always felt like a, a job was to try and sort of offer folks stuff that would you know, help their lives be better and and make them feel better about being alive. And, you know, so, um, I mean, I'm part and parcel of that, of course, is hey, well, when you're in a band that's calling itself Triumph, <laughs> at yeah. a certain point you're kind of going like, well, all right, so, you know, what exactly are we saying here? You know, what is the Triumph? Um, so, yeah, you know, that whole thing of trying to be positive and offer something of, of value. And when I was teaching college, I used to say to the students, you know, in the transaction of entertaining folks, you can't go wrong if what you're trying to do is offer something in there that's uh, more than money can buy. So, you know, whatever it is, when the value that you're putting into your work um you know, uh, uh, whether it's a, a dramatic element or, or a, you know, an inspirational one, whatever, the, the, the idea is to make it so that uh, people go, wow, man, yeah, that ticket cost me 50 bucks, but, you know, I would have paid anything for that moment. That was incredible, you know, and I guess that's the old MasterCard thing, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I unfortunately never had the privilege of seeing you guys live. I watched the DVDs and the videos, but... I was always a dream come true. I never got to see you guys live, but still, like you say, the the soundtrack to our lives. I know that, you know, I've been coming up on 20 years with my wife now, and even going back to somebody's out there, and you know, is it faith or random chance? How can I decide? That used to be my motto for like, you know, well, if you're gonna find the perfect woman, what's your prospect? I'm like, you know, is it faith or random chance? How can I die? How can I decide? You know, are we victims of circumstance when destinies collide? Between you and Neil Peart, your lyrics were the soundtrack to my life. There's something about the the Canadian power trios and your brilliant lyrics and positive outlook on life and obviously philosophical views as well. I mean, you guys didn't really talk about the sex, drugs, and rock and roll per se. I, it's interesting. You, you uh, I, I read today that the band before you joined was called Abernathy Sh Shagnaster. What the hell were they were they thinking with that name? <laughs> well, that was Gil, right? That yeah, was I figured it's Gil or Mike. Yeah, the, the drummer. Um, and it was actually. 
Well, you know, you say, uh, what the hell were they thinking? The actual full title of the band was Abernathy Shagmasters Wash and Wear Rock and Roll Band. Oh, my God. That's, that's what they were actually called. But it was kind of like a, a weekend warrior pickup kind of a band where guys would come in and uh, they would have a sort of a standard repertoire of cover songs and, and then a lot of blues that they would jam on and stuff. And I think it was just a question of the times. That was the kind of band that Gil had, and it was his band. He would kind of manage it and book it, and, and right. uh, he, he would sing a lot of the tunes, and he was the drummer. But uh, and then and some gigs they'd have five guys and some gigs they'd have six or seven guys you know like people would come in and out of it and that was how we met Mike the bass player Mike came in to sort of Gil called him up and said you know I need a bass player you know you got to come up and Mike said no I don't want to <laughs> he said no at the time Mike was managing bands and stuff and um, he talked him into it and then Mike was in Abernathy Shagmaster and they were talking and then they said we should start something and really take a serious crack at the something that would be the big time a recording act you know of a, a, a kind of a large scale production kind of show thing we just need to find the uh, the guitar player that'll fit so one thing led to another but yeah the, the triumph sort of grew out of nobody ever called it Abernathy Shag so they everybody just called it Abby Shag and right. then nobody knew what Abby Shag meant it just sounded weird you know you could stump the trunk on that one I bet I bet Eddie doesn't even know that one yeah, and Stages is one of my favorite live albums of all time. Even this two studio albums, like, you know, um, with Mind Games and the video you guys did for that. But um, I will have to say that as much as I know so much about Triumph, I've had an honor and privilege of learning so much about your solo stuff in the last week or two, um, thanks to the reissues and so much other stuff. I just missed out on all those after you left Triumph, um, after Surveillance. You know, I know they did one more album with that other guy, and it was on the Hellraiser 3 soundtrack and everything. Although you had a, on your first solo album, you had a song from Problem Child, Problem Child 2. Interesting. But um, I never really followed your solo crew, and I don't know why. And I actually see that you guys, I'm, we're, you're talking to us right now in Cincinnati, Ohio. I see you released a DVD that you filmed from Cincinnati, Ohio called Live in Cincy. Wish I would have been yeah. at that show. <laughs> yeah, it, it, was, it was a good show. It was fun. Yeah, there was a guy, he, uh, I'm going to remember, I think it was from Meadsville, Pennsylvania. And... Uh, Lachevsky, Jim Lachevsky. Okay. And he said he was starting up a video company and he wanted to, you know, shoot a show so that he could have something for his, uh, you know, I don't know, like demo reel kind of thing. Oh, okay. And, um, so, and Jim had done, he promoted a show that we played at the theater in Meadsville. And so, okay, you know, we, we, we did a night in Cincy and it was, uh, it was fun. It was good. It was great. You know, um, those kinds of things. I mean, all of that repertoire, uh, you know, the 11 uh, digital CDs that, that uh, Roundhill has reissued, right. and then all the other stuff that, I mean, Roundhill didn't buy at all, but, you know, um, you're, you know, you're mentioning the DVDs and stuff, that wasn't part of the Roundhill reissue thing, okay. but um, all of that stuff, it was, for me, it was just a question of um, making these things because I'm creative and so I just I want to be creative and so I would be making these things and putting them up on my website and heading out on the road and playing shows and selling them off the stage and I was never really aggressive about you know tr uh, making sure that they were on iTunes and making sure they were on streaming services like Pandora and Spotify and all these things so in a way after all of this time and the accumulation of all this stuff uh, you know Roundhill comes along and they're sort of uh, doing this lovely thing of, of, of reissuing the back catalog. But my own personal sort of philosophy was I, I just kept moving forward. I didn't really look back, and I didn't really... Once something was out and I put it out and we got our money back, and, and, and I would just move on to the next one, you know. Um, and it's kind of been a, a, a philosophy of mine that I really just... You know, a standard question you always get asked in interviews is, oh, what's your favorite song you ever wrote? And I, was, <laughs> I won't ask that. My, fa my, my favorite one is the next one, you know. So. Oh, that's awesome. Well, and you're yeah. such a, you're, I mean, you play rock, blues, jazz, classical, bluegrass, flamenco, folk. You're, you should be in the Guinness Book of World Record to be able to play every different kind of you know, form of guitar. I mean, listening to Triumph even back in the day when I heard Imbrugio and stuff like that. 
you were the first person I ever saw play a double neck guitar because I never po watched Jimi Hendrix play. And, you know, and then I saw you do it. And then I would get these Triumph cassettes. And there was always a cool, like, interlude or something like that that was clearly stepping out of that hard rock, arena rock sound. So you could show that you were leaning towards that. And it's interesting, I guess they were all released on your birthday. Those CDs fetch a, a serious price. So is it going to just be digital that they put out for those 11, or will there be CD and vinyl? Because the originals cost a fortune. I've seen them up to $400 on, on uh, Amazon. Yeah, I, mean, I, I don't. I think what uh, Round Hill's intentions are. I mean, you know, there's never been any explicit conversation about it, but uh, they're, I think they've just put them out digitally. Okay. And it'll be a litmus test. You know, they'll sort of see how do they do, and if and if there seems to be, you know, a stronger desire for some other than, than others, they might put something out on vinyl. You know, I don't know, and mm -hmm. not even compact discs, not even CDs, like I. They're, they're just doing it digitally at this point. You know? Right, which is a good which start. Is okay by me. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm just happy that, you know, I've got somebody that's showing support for the stuff that I did, you know. Um, I mean, generally speaking, and, uh, you know, I want to make sure that you, you, you know, you just, that was a kind of a rambling little thing there. I want to make sure I cover a, a few things that you raised. First of all, in, in the early days of Triumph, when we first started, we, we didn't have a lot of time to be writing original material and we're, we're before the first album. And uh, Mike Levine was sort of producing, and he said, well, what about if you did, like, Rick, could you do a guitar piece? And that would eat up some time on the record. Oh, really? And so the, the very first album had Blinding Light Show, right. which was a song that had actually written with the two guys that I was in, Act 3, before Triumph. Oh, okay. And um, so that was one of the first songs, and then... Um, a, a guitar piece that I'd written when I was a student at, at uh, Humber College. That was the, because they were both in the key of E minor. So that sort of became this triumph thing that there was like a kind of a progressive uh, concept uh, kind of tune, longer kind of tune, and then a guitar piece. And it was just a tradition that we kept going. We were always kind of short on material. And so... You know, I would always get a chance to put uh, guitar pieces on, which I was very grateful that the other guys would give me that opportunity, because Triumph was a, you know, an arena rock band. It was exactly. a fairly narrow kind of uh, musical thing that Triumph was, but on record, you know, they'd allow me to put a little jazz song or, you know, as you say, a Spanish guitar piece. Yeah, or flamenco for sure. Definitely. Yeah, those were the things that sort of gave Triumph a little bit more. Uh, breadth, you know, a little bit more uh, kind of um, scope. And, and um, yeah, I mean, you know, the reason I left the band was because I did want to have the opportunity to, uh, you know, pursue other kinds of things. And finally, I just want to say this, you know, yeah, it's, you know, all these styles and stuff, it's not because I'm trying to prove something. It's really just because that's where my my inclinations lead me and I don't necessarily think of myself as a very good classical guitar player or a very good jazz guitar player or you know I like I'm, I'm I feel pretty good about playing blues things because that's kind of what I grew up on and you know uh, I think of myself more as a folky than anything else that I, I right. accompany my songwriting with my own guitar playing. So the guitar playing, the range of, of, of styles really just comes out of me chasing songwriting things that have, you know, eventually end up in those, in, in those stylistic ballparks. But, you know, uh, I hasten to suggest that, you know, I'm a jack of all trades, master of none. You know, I, I really don't think of myself as... I know other people sometimes say it, and it's a lovely thing to see and to read and to hear. And I know that in my life I've been really fortunate that I've been able to rub shoulders with Steve Morris and, and George Benson and right, you know, right. some gr Steve Vai, like some really great guitar players. But uh, I don't know, like in, in my own head, I don't necessarily think of myself as being in that league. I think I kind of was able to sidle on over into that league just because I was a guy that could sing and write and play and you know wrote columns for guitar magazines and so i had this kind of uh articulate kind of uh comprehensive approach that maybe made it so that it was like oh okay you know well, well i will include Emmett in that group <laughs> yeah 
And then some some of the stuff I've discovered, for example, is the Strung Out Troubadour stuff, which is just absolutely ma amazing with Dave Dunlop. I'm hoping they reissue that Recovery 9 live thing you did with the Don Henley, Billy Joel, Police, Springsteen covers. Because I heard that you did a Monty Python for the uh, Galaxy song from Meaning of Life. I'd love to hear that. Yeah, and it, it was fun. And that was a great record, uh, you know. The, the, uh, the deal that Roundhill made was predicated on the fact that they wanted my masters and they wanted the publishing. Okay. And so, of course, on an album like Recovery Room 9, it's all cover songs. They're right. all... Right, you, know, you got to get the deal. licensing. Yeah, that's a pain, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so there's no publishing there. So they right. were not interested right. initially in those. But... Um, you know, might, it might come up and get onto the table for next year, depending on, you know, how well all of this goes. <laughs> and my favorite new discovery is, is airtime, because that takes me back to the Triumph days, because that's the heaviest, most powerful stuff you've done, in my opinion, since Triumph. Was that intentional, yeah. or was that just something to do different, or...? Well, the, you know, you mentioned the Strung Out Troubadours, and that was my sort of partnership with Dave Dunlop, and Dave, right. you know, would go out and accompany me uh, when I would play essentially solo acoustic gigs, but then he was along for the ride, you know, playing guitar. So now it sort of turned into a guitar duo, vocal duo kind of a thing. So that project grew out of that with him. But I also had a friend, a singer who, who was in a band called Von Groove okay. and a drummer named Mike Shotton. And he had a studio and he kept saying, come on, you got to come on. We, we should do some writing and we should do some recording. And, you know, he had me play on a few sessions of his uh, over the years, and then he said, come on, we, we should do a rock record. And I mean, I, I had connections to labels in Japan and Germany and stuff, so we got the record finished, and then we, we made deals and we sold it in, in other territories. So, um, yeah, I, he, you know, that was kind of a reflection of Mike and what, the direction he wanted to go, some of the tunes that he had written. And then his energy was, come on, it should be really hard rock. I really want you to be singing high again. And yeah, yeah, that sounds hard great. And, it's... You know, I want you to be going for it. And so he was kind of kicking my ass. And so that's kind of where that one went. But um, it was it was unusual for me. It, by that point in time, I think it was around 2007, right. I hadn't really been doing hard rock for, for a long time. And there was a progressive kind of a of an element to that record. It almost had, you know, it would have its moments where it was, veering towards rush territory or yeah, yeah. you know a little bit of a dream theater kind of a thing yep. or so it was, it was fun it was a and boy oh boy like mike was a uh, very hard worker and you know, he still is uh, and um he really knew his way around his studio like there was a lot of pro tools stuff we would layer guitars all day long and i had to do a vocal and he'd do a vocal harmony and then we'd double it and triple it and so <laughs> There was a lot of digital recording uh, technology going on in that one. Well, that is definitely one of my favorite new discoveries. I, uh, I've got it digitally. I'll probably burn it on CDR just so I can play it a bunch of times. But one CD I did track down was the Rick Emmett and Resolution 9. Speaking of Rush and Dream Theater, you got to work with Alec Lifeson and James Labrie on that, as well as possibly a Triumph reunion on the Grand Parade song where you played all those, you got the, the you know, reunited with the three guys doing the acoustic Grand Parade. So... Yes. What was, what was, how did that, what is Resolution 9? Is that a new thing you're doing? I mean, that's already four years ago, but why was it called Resolution 9? Is that it, well, it was the start of something, and, you know, who knew where it was going to lead? It was essentially a guy, an AR man from a label out of Amsterdam called Mascot Provogue. Okay. And, it, like, Mascot is this sort of the, the mothership, and Provogue is more of their sort of bluesy, subset thing and they've got people on that label like Joe Bonamassa and, and right Wayne I thought I recognized the names yeah Robin Ford and so again a very guitar oriented kind of label and the guy that runs it is really into that so they made me an offer and uh, we, we did up a contract but the way that I sort of approached it was I wanted to create a band which was which was called Resolution 9 and um the album was called Res 9, and it was like, essentially, if, you know, if this thing keeps going, then this band will tour and will go and we'll play. But it, in, unfortunately, the record came out, and then the record company, you know, for whatever reason, they just didn't really get behind it. They didn't make 
in the contract, it so called for things like that they were there. supposed to do production videos and stuff, and then they didn't do it. So, um, you know, I kind of was uh, unhappy and losing faith in them. They didn't uh, account when they were supposed to account, and, it, you know, so eventually I just said, look, they were coming back at that point saying, yeah, well, geez, we didn't really see as many sales on the first one. And they had done things like made vinyl records right off the bat, and and they had done lyric videos for, for the Internet. Right. But they really just pulled the plug. And, and I thought, you know, they're not committing in a marketing way. Uh, and so and the, the guy would phone me and ask me, you know, are you going to tour Europe? Are you coming over? Are you going to tour Europe? And I said, well, you know, I don't really have a European agent, you know, that can hook me up, but you've got other acts that are going on over there and touring, and you've got, you know, Bottom Ass is playing all over the place, and you got Walter Trout playing places. Why don't you, you know, hook me up with a manager or an agent that can, you know, sort of business-wise make this happen? And they never did. It never happened. So it all kind of fell apart, and I, I lost heart, I lost interest, and then I went, okay, just let me out of the contract, you know. Let's just call it quits. Yeah. Uh, I'll, you know, I'll go back to what I was doing before. I'm perfectly happy doing what I was doing before. Well, Rick, so, you wrote some, that. you wrote some great songs on that album. Whether it starts out with that bluesy type ZZ Top vibe on the opening track, or with the Triumph reunion on Grand Parade, or just the songs with Alex from Rush and James from Dream Theater, or your own songs singing about ice cream and what you like to eat, and you know the outlook <laughs> on life. I find I am so glad I discovered that in airtime so recently now going on to the upcoming late on the line documentary is that any connection with sam dunn yeah it is yeah, sam banger. dunn that's wow banger film. sam dunn and uh, mark ricciardelli who did maiden and rush and zz time, top but... and wow so those yeah. those canadians are probably very proud to represent the second most powerful uh, trio from Canada, <laughs> first yeah. Russia now. Well, you know, I mean, obviously the comparisons get made, and and that stuff does show up in the documentary. I've seen a rough cut, and it 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 is really interesting. Although there's something surreal too about you know people going, hey, this is your life. We're going back and we're doing excavations, uh, archaeological digs on on you know where your life was at and the things that happened, and and I kind of think, well. Okay, but in some ways it's like ancient history. And again, I mentioned earlier about right. I, I'm never really one that looks back over my shoulder. And right. stuff. Yeah. I, I, you know, I'm always looking ahead and looking to the horizon. And, you know, there's that whole Zen thing of not wanting to live in the past because that's full of regret. regret and then right, not right. wanting to live in the future because that's full of anxiety. You just want to be in the <laughs> present. That's so I've awesome. I always felt that that was the most... Um, you know, the, that was a healthy thing psychologically, just to to be here and to be looking forward. You know, so but you know we're at that age and stage, I guess, where yeah, people want to be making uh, documentaries and um, you know, Walk of Fame and all of these kinds of things that happen, and you kind of go, okay, it's nice, it's lovely, you know, but I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think it's healthy for an artist to get too caught up in. If somebody's telling you how great you are, then that would mean that you also have to take very seriously if somebody tells you they think you're shit. <laughs> and right. Like, I'm not going to necessarily let other people, and then, you know, believe me, we can go back into the past and find, you know, when albums came out, the Triumph albums, and, you know, Rolling Stone was saying, like, oh, this oh is I know. This is terrible, you know. I like, know. But uh, you're not going to let that define you any. So, you know, I mean, I'm not going to let other people define who I am by whether or not they like me or not. I'm going to, you know, do what I do and um, hope that I feel confident and happy. Like, you know, I was disappointed in what Mascot did with that Res 9 record, but I'm not I'm not unhappy with that record. I think that's a oh, terrific yeah. record. I, I really too. thought I wrote some great tunes. You did. I was really happy to have those other people involved in it. It's just... You know, um, once it's done, it's done. And, right. you know, because that thing didn't work out business-wise, okay, it's, it's time to move on to something else then, you know. Um, so, you know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't live in the past, right? You know, I'm... <laughs> That's such a great... I, you I'm have... here. I'm on the phone with Michael Francisco right now. Yeah, okay, you so. truly... God, thank you. You truly have the magic power. That's all I can say. But in, all, in, 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 in their defense, they are Canadians, 
and they love hard rock and heavy metal. And I think they want to represent the band for the fans because there's probably a lot of people who have only heard a few of the songs on the radio and may not really know what went on. I know you don't want to revisit all that, which, you know, you know, like you say, look forward, which is a great attitude. But I think there's some, you know, those of us who love Triumph so much, you know, just like with Rush, you know, even after, yeah. even after Neil Peart died, everybody's constantly like, oh my God, I, I wear a Rush hat all the time to work. And it's like, did you hear the drummer died? Did you hear the drummer died? And everybody was so sympathetic. So I think there's a, yeah. a certain connection with that. And I think that's what no, they ultimately sure. want to do. And, and of course, you know, we talked earlier about the, the soundtrack of people's lives. Absolutely. Like, the songs <laughs> matter to people on a level that um, it, it's a different thing than it, it, than it is for me. You know, those songs mark... Uh, you know milestones on my journey um, and but for other people they have and I have records like that in my life you know Steely Dan albums and Led Zeppelin records and you know Beatles albums and you know stuff that mattered to me uh, on, on a DNA kind of level you know and I get that and and certainly it's my responsibility as a performing artist to make sure that those things get recognized so I mean, well, one of the things Banger did for the documentary was they flew in fans from all over the world, and we actually Triumph did a little reunion uh, concert, a surprise kind of thing, where we played three songs. Yeah, I read about for, that for these fans, and and they filmed the whole thing, and it was unbelievable. The energy in the room was just you know beyond the beyond. It was, it was pretty good. That's, that's... <laughs> and they've got it for the documentary, so you know it it sort of provides a lovely climax to to the scope of their storytelling. Well, like I said, I've always been a Triumph fan, especially a fan of you, especially, I, I, went on, I will go on record and say that I think you are the first true power metal vocalist. I never considered Triumph to be a metal band per se, any more than Deep Purple was a metal band, but there was something about your vocals, just like Ian Gillian's vocals, that just set a precedent, and speaking of which, Deep Purple, new Deep Purple comes out tomorrow, uh, uh, set a precedent for what all these Europeans basically created in what's called power metal. And I think there was just something yeah. about the way you sang and the range you sang. And then, of course, you also had the positive lyrics, the, the true magic power, the uplifting lyrics, fight the good fight, hold on, you know, just everything like that we listen to. And, and, you know, just, you know, oh, my God, these lyrics you say became the soundtrack of our life. And that inspired so many other artists to create. I'm actually surprised I have yet to see a heavy metal tribute to Triumph. I've seen about 13 or more for Rush and about 30 for Black Sabbath. There needs to be a heavy metal tribute for Triumph because I can think of so many artists would love to contribute to that. You ever... Yeah, well, you know, there's um, there have been some discussions. Okay. Uh, about, you know, Round Hill, I think, has had some conversations. And I know that Mike Klink, who did the Sport of Kings record and then uh -huh. went on to do Appetite for, for uh, Guns N' Roses yeah. and you know, he became very popular. So he, he he's been sort of wanting to do something uh, because you know he, he's um, he's a big fan, and of course he's got a lot of connections. Yep. He's worked with a lot of bands and things, and so uh, I think one of the limitations becomes that you know, um, like well, you know, here in Canada when they did the Walk of Fame thing, they originally wanted us to play at the at the uh, you know gala dinner, and we said no, no, no we're going to do that. Why don't you get a good band? And they went, okay. They, they started to look, try to put a band together, and it was really hard to find somebody that could sing, that could cover the material. And then eventually they got Larry Gowan, who now sings for Sticks, mm -hmm. and he did a fantastic job. He was just really, really great. And uh, that was a real treat to sort of watch him perform, you know, songs that I wrote and stuff. And But, um, it, it, yeah, I, you know, I... I think it's hard, like there's a certain style of vocalist, you know, and Ronnie James Dio would be an example, and, and you mentioned Ian Gillen. I like, I, I think that that ends up being more of the style. My singing was, you know, I mean, I wasn't all the way to a kind of a John Anderson of yes, like a progressive kind of vocalist in that regard. Yeah, no, not, um, yeah, not really but, the British you know, style. He, he'd been a big influence on me. Oh, really? And, okay. Um, you know, uh, I think, um, uh, you know, Robert Plant of Led Zeppelin, you know, uh, I think those kinds of vocalists uh, in, in inspired both me and Getty Lee in, in Rush, you know. So our styles were a little bit different than other metal guys. Like James Labrie, he can bring that uh, oh, that God. metal kind of 
you know, really gun throat kind of style to his singing. I could never really do that. My voice was a different kind of a thing, you know. So, uh, and of course, I can't sing that high anymore. So. <laughs> well, you still sound good on all the stuff I've heard, and I'm so honored to be reintroduced to, like you, like you said, the strung out troubadours and the airtime, which I just discovered, you know, and so much of the other stuff it's just it's like the, the rick ambent resolution 9 it's sad that resolution didn't work out but the music endures the, like i said i was listening to it early this morning and i'm like is he singing about ice cream and how he's enjoying a dessert that's like that, that's amazing that's such a good attitude <laughs> it's just the right the right well, thing that, to do. you know those kinds of tunes are fun to write i mean when i wrote that one um i was thinking about old blues guys and you know, the kinds of styles of songs that John Lee Hooker would write or, okay. you know, Muddy Waters. And, and I wanted a tune that would sort of be in that kind of a ballpark. And again, there was this whole thing of the bluesiness of, of uh, Mascot Provoke. And I was thinking, I want to make sure I make a, a record and have a bunch of songs that sort of... And I, I've always got lots of songs. I, I write every day so, you know, I can sort of group together some stuff and make it so that, you know, a record hangs together stylistically. So, you know, that that album, um, you know, it, it runs a gamut. There's there's stuff that's like, almost like Americana rootsy rock, like yeah, My Cathedral. Yeah. And then there's kinds of tunes that are, as you said, you know, um, ZZ Top. ZZ Top, or, definitely. Or <laughs> just kind of grooving blues, like When yeah. You Were My Baby or Stand Still. Yeah. But, the Jesus just left Chicago. Talking about Sweet Tooth, they, you know, they, that's one of those old style sort of double entendre kind of tunes, like, you know, Sex and Candy or something. Yeah. <laughs> you know, put on the same level. Well, the comedian Jim Brewer uh, put out a heavy metal album four years ago, and he had a song called Sugar Rush. Um, basically oh, talking yeah. talking about his kids and how once they have too much sugar they don't want to go to bed. It's like those are the kind of lyrics I like. I like something that's d daring and different. Obviously, I love yeah. the the positive lyrics and the inspirational lyrics and the historical lyrics. But sometimes just stuff like that, the whimsical stuff, is also just like. And I and I like I said, you truly have the magic power, Rick. You truly you may have you may call it Zen, but the fact that you you make your peace with your past and you know your your next you know your favorite song is the next one you write. That's just, I, I, I admire that so much. It even it makes me venerate you more, though I don't want to because I don't want you to feel that you're on some kind of, you know, echelon, some kind of, you know, a level. But it is an honor and a privilege to speak with you. And when you you said my name, I just got the chills. I'm like, you know, because a lot of people are just like, I can't believe you're speaking with Rick Emmett. I'm like, I can't believe I'm speaking with Rick Emmett. And you just spoke with my friends from the Metal Voice. You spoke with Jimmy and Alan. And I, I know Alan was a fanboy, too, because... How could we not be? You know, I mean, you know, you're, you, you are the soundtrack for our life. We're talking for close to four decades. I don't mean to make you feel old, but for the close to four decades, you know, we've been in listening to this music, and through the '80s, especially through the '80s, when Allied Forces came out, Never Surrender came out, and Thunder Seven came out, and oh my God, the albums just kept getting better. And like I said, for me, Sport of Kings, the Mike Klink produced album, that was the that was the capper. Obviously, Tears in the Rain, you know. Uh, Guilt did a great job, and a lot of the songs Guilt did a great, great job on. But it was always something about your vocals, your guitar style, your your. It was just something about you. I just thought you were the epitome of triumph. And yeah, what a perfect name for that band. So and now yeah, I. Well, they had the band. They had the name. I know they had the name. Before I, know. I got into it, but yeah. uh, but you you. you know, I, I think I grew into that. It yeah. took me three or four years. Of, you know. Um, the songwriting that sort of went from just a game on, it was like I was starting to figure it out. Like, right, with Suitcase yeah, Blues, is, and uh, I could see yeah, that, Hold, well, on, yeah, and, Hold on. I think Hold On and Lay It on the Line were right. sort of the first couple where I was going, yeah, I, I think this is, where the, uh, this is where the band can live, you know, this right. is where the band can grow. And um, by the time we got to Allied Forces, I felt like, okay, this is... You know, we've now found ourselves. Like, I think the fight the good fight, ordinary man. Yeah, I was gonna uh, say ordinary man. Power, <laughs> that's that's pretty definitive. You know, we we had our own studio at that point. All we, the way, we man. Really knew what, what we were doing. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Well, I imagine you probably have somebody else to speak to other than me. So, as much as I'd yeah. love to talk to you all day long, I don't want to overstay my welcome. All right. Well, well uh, I've enjoyed it. I guess. Because of a typo, they called you Rick because of, I guess, of a simple t or mistake in the print or something like that. You went from your real name to 
R-I-K because of a typo and in, the, in the beginning, well, correct? It's because Mike Levine is such a bad speller. Like, <laughs> he, he, I, we, we've been on the road and I'd lent him some money. And uh, he phones me one day and he's double checking the credits that are going to go on the first album jacket. <laughs> and he's saying, oh, it's going to say like Rick Abbott, six and 12 string guitars, vocals, blah, blah, blah. I go, yeah, yeah. But you know, when you wrote me the check to pay me back for the money you owed me, you you wrote my, you spelled my name R-I-C. And I go, that's there's a K on the end. He goes, oh, oh, okay, sorry. So then when the albums get printed and they come back, instead of putting R-C-K, like adding the K, he got rid of the C and he put a K instead. He's still so sorry about like that. R-I-K. And I go, you nut. You know, like, <laughs> that's... But it was like they'd already printed like 20,000 jackets. And I go, oh, okay, I'll become Scandinavian, whatever. No, it's awesome. And you and I, and I appreciate how he was so sorry about it because that's, that, I mean, we all know you as R-I-K, Rick. I mean, that, even that was another thing when I was like, he spells his name differently. So, and I, I was just watching yeah, a bunch of. That's like one of those kind of weird things too, where it's like something like that happens. And so it, it, and now it becomes almost like that's my showbiz version of my, my mother would never, ever spell my name R-I-K. Like when she would write me birthday cards and stuff, it was always R-I-C-K. You know, yeah. uh, my dad always puts R-I-C-K. He never, like, no, he's not going to call me. He's not going to spell it R-I-K just because that's what the showbiz name is. So in a way, it's like, uh, you know, other people, it's a much more dramatic thing. It's like Alice Cooper or Sting, you know, or right, Madonna. Right. You know, you, you have this showbiz name. And in my case, it's just, well, okay, I dropped a C on a Rick. <laughs> that's cool. Okay. Take care. Cheers. All right, you same, same to you. Bye-bye. Bye.